I was like, wow, I didn't know that this was even an option. No one told yeah. me that you could apprentice under mentors or people you read about in books and, or listen to in podcasts. I didn't know that was a thing. Or people that you read about in books or watch on YouTube. Um, like that was that was cool. Like I wanted to learn right from the entrepreneurs who were doing the things, who were doing the work, not from a professor who was a prof- like who became a professor just because he got a, like a master's in it. He didn't, he didn't actually start a business yeah. or you know help others or invest in others. So um, I thought that was like the most obvious choice. And so if there was an option to work with my heroes, then yes, let me go take it. And I I mean this is the spirit of your whole podcast, so that's why. I was so excited to kind of share that that journey. So I think a good place to start is, uh, I mean, I think it's pretty interesting. Um, you're uh, like I was reading your your newsletter, your blog, uh, and you mentioned that I mean you never really were like really good at school as far as like classes. You were like really big into extracurriculars, but never really liked um, like just classes and also. Um, you ended up dropping out of college, right? Um, when you were 19, I believe. So I'd love yep. to hear a little more about that and kind of like, um, I mean, I, I can kind of relate to that experience. So I'd love to hear, yeah, your your personal take on that. Yeah, totally, man. Um, it's been a while since I last talked about this, so I'm kind of excited. Um, man, I remember just being in high school and just, I really wanted to learn. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I wanted to like learn and meet people and like have experiences but what I was learning was just not clicking. Like I, it was like me- literally memorizing what happened in this battle of this war in this era. And I was like, I, I don't care about this. How is this re- relevant to what I'm doing? Um, and so I had like a lot of other, um, you know, side hustle ventures. I sold candy in school growing up. I, nice. I was the, like the main salesman of the, the streetwear brand called Villionaire. Um, and just had a bunch of other, like I used to like do surveys and ads. Like this was before, you know, it was, e- it was easy to make money. But back then it was like 50 cents a survey, a dollar a survey. And I and I automated a lot of it. So I had the Google Chrome autofill, different addresses and different, different names and um, made some money there. So I was just trying to like do things on the side that was, uh, you know, more... Not like fulfill, like it was fulfilling. It was fun, but also like I got some money out of it. So I wanted just to do more of that. And I remember after high school, I didn't get into any of the colleges that I applied for, which really stinked because all my friends got into UC Berkeley, Stanford, like all these like big schools, and I was like at my local university. Well, you know, relatively like that's pretty good for a lot of people, but in my competitive high school, I was like the weird, like bad Asian kid, you know, who didn't like take school seriously enough. And yeah. I was, and it was kind of discouraging. So I went to San Jose State, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get straight A's. I'm gonna get a job at Google. I'm gonna show them. I'm gonna like really uh, prove everyone wrong. Uh, and I did a lot of that. Like I actually, it was actually, school actually was um, quite easy. It's easier in college, ironically, than um, high school. Yeah. But I remember paying so much money and spending so much time reading all this stuff that I that, that had no relevance to me at all. Waking up at 8 a.m. Uh, you know, for a potential biology class, like. Like was literally the trigger of like you know what I this is doesn't make any sense at all to my future and mm-hmm. what I was doing on the side was I was working on a startup called Student Hero it didn't go anywhere but I was like going to, I was volunteering at conferences I was reading books I was volunteering at workshops I was working with my business partner in order to make this new platform come to life and I was learning so much from like even listening to like the Y Combinator um, founder school the startup school I, I listened to that maybe twice um, in that one year and I was like man. I'm learning so much. Why, why am I learning from this kind of like failed business entrepreneur who teaching me about general admin stuff? Oh, which yeah. just didn't make any sense to me. So I made the trigger to uh, I made the decision to drop out at 19. Um, it was scary, obviously, at the time, but it, it felt very logical to me. And my friends were like, "Damn, you know, I I wish I could do that, I, but I, you know, um, I never could." And I was like, "Oh, why not?" It's like, "Oh, my parents, you know, would." wouldn't approve or like I don't know what what I would do and I was like dude I don't know what I'm doing my parents don't approve but just, you know like I it, it just felt it just felt logically right and um I can go more into like how, why I trust my gut and all these things now before to this day but um yeah. that's a very quick snapshot of like my upbringing growing up that's awesome man um what uh I'm curious like what was the plan like what was the plan when you dropped out cuz like it's kind of I mean I I it's, I kind of had a similar episode. Where I went to, um, actually, initially went to business school in Barcelona in Europe, and wow. kind of felt similar. It was like my 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 parents took out like a loan for the first year, and after that, I was gonna have to pay for myself. And it's like 
the, it was really expensive. And in France, like you get free education normally, uh, but it was like going to like a private business school, like because I wanted to go wow. to like one of the best, you know. And it's like um, yeah. I just felt so guilty of like like I'm not really learning anything. Like I know I don't want to go into like accounting, banking, finance, finance, you know. And it's like I, I want to start a business, and I'm really not learning this at all here. And so yeah. like similar, I know it was like a huge. It, it took a while for me to wrestle with that decision, right? And so I was like curious, like, mm. did was it scary for you? And what um what was your plan? Like, were you just like, I'm gonna figure it out later, or did you have a plan? Because <laughs> like that's what I did. I was like, I'll figure it out. You know, I didn't have a plan, which in hindsight I definitely should have had. You know, but uh, curious totally. to hear how it was like for you. Oh yeah, in hindsight, I would have done everything differently. I would have had a plan. I would have <laughs> had a better conversation with my parents. I would have, you know, had more clarity, like all these different things. But you know, I'm very glad of the path I took. And yeah. similar to you, man, I I was at a point where we didn't have enough money for the next semester, and so my mom was like, "Go and take some loans." And I was like, "Okay, mom, but we have credit card debt still. Like, how much money do you have in the bank?" And you know, like, let's think about this like math, like financially. And my mom is one of those people who would not talk about finances at all. Like, she would literally like, give me the silent treatment and like shun me for like talking about this stuff. But I'm like, this, I'm an adult now, you know. We're gonna take this big loan. I, I don't want to take this blindly, and then we get to pay it off later on. And uh, and this doesn't make any sense. So I just couldn't confidently take out a loan in order to continue school, which was something that I didn't even want in the first place. And yeah. so I was luckily working at the time on a startup. Um, and I think the famous quote of like clarity comes with action. So by working on the startup, I was like learning all about marketing and sales and landing pages and building a product and all these different things. Um, while this doing this business, stu- student hero you're talking about, right? It was called student hero. Yeah, we try to connect high school students to internships and summer programs because I wish when I was in high school I was exposed to all this stuff and no one told me about it until I got to college. I was like, what the heck? People know what their major is. I had I, had, I went in with like I wanted to study like rhetoric or something. I, I don't I didn't even know what my major was um, <laughs> when I applied to different schools. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So I I had a plan of like I want to do this startup and didn't really know what's next after that. But three months. After I dropped out, um, the startup didn't go anywhere um, because, like, I forgot that you had to like make a make some money off of the business. So we spent all this time. It's really stupid, like making T-shirts and business cards and stickers, and we even had a booth at like a conference. Like we did all this like the fun superficial stuff yeah. versus like validating the idea and like will businesses actually pay for high school students to come work at them, uh, work at their companies. Usually not, um, but we thought we were being unique because we're different from college internship boards. So um, that didn't go too well. And I was like, at this point, I can go back to college or I can go learn on my own. And that was what I kind of leaned towards. And I, I can talk more about like all the internships I did and all the things that I that I was was doing all after that. But in short, I didn't have a plan. I, you know, wanted to work in the startup, didn't go as planned, um, and I had to figure it out in the way. How um, that inflection point where you had to make a decision of like, should I go back or not? Like, how far out was that? Like, a couple months, like a year? Yeah, that was three months out. So it was three, or three out, or four yeah. months. It was it was quite short. Um, so in total, I was working for like nine months for Student Hero, um, and it I mean it was a really fun idea, and it was cool to have that some experience. Uh, but more importantly, like it was like a vehicle for me to like use it to learn and apply all the stuff that I'm learning outside. To this thing, and even if the thing doesn't work, all those lessons still applied. And so when I went into different internships and jobs, I was able to kind of draw from that kind of background knowledge. Nice. And um, before we get into the internship stuff, I know like we're both, I think, big fans of uh, Charlie Hohen, like his book Recession yeah. for Graduate. And like I know I was like I think that book kind of inspired me to go on the path that I did of like kind of like apprenticing for for these different like entrepreneurs. Uh, so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on on the book and um, and how how that inspired you to uh, to kind of take a, like an unconventional like apprenticeship uh, internship type uh, type path. Yeah, I mean that book should be like the sponsor for this podcast because <laughs> that book really was a big impact in my life. I was like, wow, I didn't know that this was even an option. No one told yeah. me that you could apprentice under mentors or people you read about in books and or listen to in podcasts. 
I didn't know that was a thing. Or people that you read about in books or watch on YouTube, um, like that was that was cool. Like I wanted to learn right from the entrepreneurs who were doing the things, who were doing the work, not from a professor who was a prof- like who became a professor just because he got a, like a master's in it. He didn't, he didn't actually start a business yeah. or you know help others or invest in others. So um, I thought that was like the most obvious choice. And so if there was an option to work with my heroes, then yes, let me go take it. And I, I mean, this is the spirit of your whole podcast, so that's why I was so excited to kind of share. That that journey, hell yeah, hell yeah, yeah. That 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 book was huge for me as well. And it's like honestly, when I read it, it, it sounded too good to be true. Where I was like, like, like this guy, like he's a little different, you know. It's like it's like it's like not everyone can really do this, right? But it's like then I actually went and like did it and like was able to work literally like work with like two of the people I kind of like was inspired uh, by like as a teenager in college of like oh like. This is the type of entrepreneur I want to be, you know. And it's like, yeah. shit. Like, <laughs> I actually made it happen. So, like, how how did you uh, get started on that path? I mean, it kind of happened all accidentally because after I dropped out, I started working for a couple of different people, um, like Margaret Jackson, who was like a local business coach and radio show person. I did some uh, some internships uh, at a like at a startup accelerator. I did an internship, uh, or I had a job at a, my a local uh, career center, or the college career center. So I had a couple of different odd jobs here and there. I was just really just trying to dive in, just say yes to all the opportunities that come in. And it wasn't until I read this blog post. I forgot what it exactly was, but it was about if you want to uh, like learn as much as you can when you're young, you should join what's called a rocket ship company. Mm-hmm. And this is essentially a, a slang for a high growth early. Not maybe not early, but like high growth startup who's doing amazing things, and this would be like your network, and um, you know the skills that you learn will be there for the rest of your life that will carry you for the rest of your career. And so I was asking Sam Parr, uh, who's the founder of the Hustle, because I volunteered at one of his conferences that he hosted, which is a called Hustle Con, a business conference that brought different speakers in, um, including Tom from Quest. Uh, yeah, that's I actually him, where like, I met him. We, it's uh, another story, but that's actually where oh, I. Oh, you definitely met Sam. That, that that's that's where I met Tom, and eventually, oh, no like way. like two weeks, basically the the following week after hearing him, like I kind of reached out to like for a job, you know. Um, oh, that's amazing! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The HustleCon was huge. I was there at the second one, um, the 2015, and then I went back when Tom was there, which I think was in 2017. So you probably yeah. we probably crossed paths, right? At that uh, that the second one. Yeah. Well, I, I hosted that second one. Wow. Yeah. So that was like a cool experience. Like I got it. Like yeah, Tom was there for the rest of the whole day. He he had this thing where he didn't want to leave the conference until we answered every single person or talked to every single person who wanted to who waited to talk to him. So yep. he was a champ for that. Um, but yeah, I, I asked Sam because I volunteered for the the first one, which we might have crossed paths at, and I was like, hey Sam, yeah, this is all through Facebook Messenger. I was like, hey Sam, like I'm trying to join a rocket ship company. Like, do you have any recommendations? I because I didn't know the startup world. I I, I was kind of lost. Um, and so Sam was like, "Dude, Tam, you should join us." And I was like, "Are you serious?" And like, you know. And then we made some jokes, but lo and behold, like two, one two weeks later, we signed a contract, and we like, I ended up living on his couch for the next three months. Internships was like six months later, but like we ended up like being glued together for like twenty four hours. And at this time, I was like nineteen. Sam was twenty three. This was when the hustle had you know ten thousand email subscribers. Yeah. Today they're at like. 1.5 million or something like this was like the early early days. So I really got to see that inner workings of of things, and um, I didn't know Sam was going to be this like big entrepreneur that he he is now. But it was he was just a kid, just like me, um, and we were all just trying to figure it out. So it was quite interesting to see that progression, and obviously to see how far the hustle has come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for people who aren't familiar, um, I'm sure a lot of people will be, but. Um, I mean, the hustle now has like million plus, couple like a million plus like email subscribers, like sending out an email every day. They just sold to uh, HubSpot for I think it's undisclosed, but like eight figures, you know, and um, yeah. just like yeah. So Sam's a really accomplished entrepreneur. But you were there, like basically at the inception of this, right? Which is pretty crazy. Basically, yeah. I mean, I was I was working there, and literally, it's so funny because I tell Sam this story a lot whenever I see him. I'm like. Uh, we were sitting in this like small little apartment building in Sunset, uh, in Inner Sunset in San Francisco, and we don't have a lot of traffic. We're not getting very good open rates. We have like ten thousand people on our email list, and Sam was looking around. He's like, "Tam, like we're gonna make Vice look small. Like we're gonna take over like CNN." 
And I'm looking around this little tiny apartment where we we share a conference room with like two other startups in this small building. And I'm like, Sam, you're you're crazy. We don't even have a strategy for this. Was even before there was a newsletter. We didn't even have a newsletter yet. It was just um, we we're trying to be like a Vice meets Business Insider, um, like business edgy news kind of thing. Um, and so this was like, it was bewildering to me. But you know, obviously, the visionaries are wildly optimistic. And yeah, he proved me wrong. I mean, he didn't prove. I didn't doubt him by any stretch. But I was just kind of like. This is not where normal people or like realistic people are are thinking about right now. So, I saw a lot of the the early workings of it. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I, I was even there. Like when we were at hosting HustleCon, we were like at Costco, like putting muffins on the big little wagons and <laughs> trying to buy all the stuff for HustleCon. And you know, it, it was quite quite an adventure. That's it. Yeah, that's very cool. What um, what. Was it like like crashing on Sam's couch? Because like that's pretty like that that's that's pretty much as close as you can get access to someone, right? Yeah, I know. I, I really didn't want to like bother him too much. Yeah. Um, and it, it felt weird because like Sam had his own room, so like it was fine. But you know, there'd be times where like his girlfriend was over, and like you yeah. know, like I'm, I'm on this couch, and I didn't. But it's basically those three months or six months were like the hustle was like my life. I was there. I wanted to be like Kobe Bryant. I wanted to be there the earliest and like the latest to leave. Um, so I was like a workhorse while I was there and just trying to prove myself and like prove my worth. Um, but yeah, wor- like living with Sam, it was, I mean, it was kind of like you didn't have your own space. Um, and I don't know if Sam like really enjoyed me there um, because like you know he he's his own individual too and like, he wants his own space. So at a certain point. And also keep in mind, we live with three other people, so it wasn't just like us. It was like a apartment in like Glendale or, or forgot the Glen Park. Yeah, um, you know, living Glen in this Park. like house. So yeah. we had to share like the bathroom in the mornings before we went to. Work. It just it was. It yeah, was quite I, a lot. I, I could see how it's. <laughs> well, it could be a little awkward. Um, cool. So were you? Was this a paid position, or were you like um, kind of volunteering for free? No, this was paid. Uh, luckily, it was paid. And it it barely bent my needs, um, but you know it was paid. He gave me some housing, which yeah. was nice. Um, and yeah, it but it was nothing. It was like very little money. Gotcha. Better than free though. That's cool. Um, oh yeah. And totally. and then after six months, uh, why did why do you decide to leave and kind of like move on to the to the next um, chapter? Yeah. Well, at a certain point, like in full honesty, I wasn't really into the newsletter idea. Like, I mean, not that like it was a bad idea, but it was more like. I was clearly not equipped to be a writer for the hustle at that time mm-hmm. in my life. I was 19, and w- our audience was like, you know, 30 something year old like techies who were really into business and the latest news and all this stuff. And at that point, I could care less about what the hell Apple was doing or yeah. what the hell this new startup is. Ch- like Cheddar just started, and like, oh, Cheddar was this, and like, oh, Peter Thiel, um, and you know, all these different names and stuff. I was like, I. This is not like what fulfills me. Like at that time, I was really big into community building. I was really into like knowing each and every member of the of the like the readers that we have in, in the hustle. Um, and yeah, like in full honesty, like they didn't really value community as much as I did. Yeah. Um, they were much more and respectively so. They're founders and they're they have investors, so they were focused on email subscribers. They're yeah. open on open rates. They're focused on traffic. They're open on all these different metrics. But um, community was a bit hard to measure. So. And I was like, you know what? Like, what what is the option? I could stay here and make like and and accept the full time job with like forty k a year or whatever. Like, re, like you know, living in San Francisco. But I was like, is this my future? Like, do I really want this? And I had a really good heart to heart with John, who was the co founder of the um, of the company. And um, we just sat down on a bench one day after a one on one, and we we're he was just telling me like, honestly, like you know what? Like that's probably not <laughs> what's best for you, you know. And we just had a good heart to heart, and um, I felt like I did my tour of duty. Like I felt like I've like you know, poured everything into what I can yeah. here, but I knew I needed something different. I needed I needed somewhere that could like feel like kind of get out my other potential, um, and for someone who wants to value community more, um, frankly. Yeah, yeah, totally. And how did that um, how how did that come about? I know after you worked with uh, Andrew from Mixer G, right? Andrew Warner. So how how did that um, how did that opportunity come up, and uh, how did you start working behind the scenes with him? 
Yeah, I mean it's super cool because um, when you're at the hustle, you they you meet all these cool people. I, I got to meet all the speakers who went to the hustle con. Um, there's like a speaker dinner where we invite special guests, investors, and all these things that we you know that we um, celebrate before the day of hustle con. And um, I, Andrew Warner has known of me for a long time, apparently, and he was a part of the the hustle ambassadors group that the group that I manage. And he was like, dude, Tam is like, he didn't know who I was, but he's like, dude, Tam is killing it. Like, Tam is like going, you know, like doing it, like all these things on this Facebook group. I want someone like Tam. And then he actually came, it's funny, it's really glad you asked that because he actually came, I forgot about this story. He came to the hustle office to film a Mixergy course um, of Sam Parr. And mm. it was going to talk about how Sam, you know, got 100,000 100, subscribers uh, in, in six months or something. And I remember it was Sam in front. Uh, Andrew behind a camera, and then there's me on the side, and I'm coaching Sam on what to say about the ambassador program because he's not focused on the ambassador program; he's focused on other things, which you know is his priority. And so I was telling him what to say about the different um, uh, metrics and how we did stuff and all these things, so he can be on the camera and like be the face of it. And there was one actually incident where Sam wanted to say something a, a certain way. And I pushed back and I said, no, I think we should say it this way because of these reasons. And then he pushed back again saying, no, 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 I think we should do it this way. And I like held my ground. I like, like was on the defense. I was like, yeah. no, damn, like this is, I feel very strongly about this. Like we don't want to do this because of these. I forgot what the actual topic was. But here's Andrew Warner kind of looking at this debate and Sam was like, okay, you're right. Um, we'll do it that way. Or I don't know what he said, but Andrew was just blown away. He was like, who is this kid? Telling the CEO like, <laughs> how to say what about his company, like it was, and I learned this actually from Sam. So it's kind of meta how this all turned out. But Andrew was so um, enamored by my energy, and so he uh, saw me at the speaker dinner, and he actually asked me, like he kind of did that old trick of like, "Hey Tam, like I love what you're doing with the Facebook community. Like, do you know anyone who can do that for Mixergy?" Interesting. <laughs> and, um, this is he actually asked, the he asked you the, the day of, like the day of that recording, or later. This was after. So okay. the, this was the recording, and then afterwards, when we met at the speaker dinner, he was one of oh, like, the friends dinner, of yeah. us. Um, he asked me this question, and this is perfect timing because it was kind of like at my transition out yeah. of the hostel, like after I had that heart to heart with John, and yeah. I was like, well, I, I can do that thing because I've listened to Andrew, like I listened to Andrew Warner from Mixergy on the way to, um, call, like, to classes, and I would like be. In my car, wait. I I can't wait to like. Um, I didn't want to get out of the car because I wanted to listen to this interview that he's doing. So I've known of Andrew for a long time, and I was. It felt like an honor to like be able to, you know, for him to compliment me and also offer me, you know, a position. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Andrew uh, Mixer G has been was a big inspiration for me as well. It's like basically one of the. It's like it was the number one entrepreneurship podcast. Kind of still is. I think it's like premium membership. But like I, I just remember being like. Holy shit! This guy is interviewing like like a couple in entrepreneurs every week, right? It was yeah. like like the guy that's like the most consistent with like the volume and like the amount of people just he's interviewed throughout throughout his career. It's 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 crazy. Oh, he's he's the OG. Like yeah. Tim Ferriss asked him for advice. Yeah. When he before he started his show on like how how to get started and yeah. stuff. So Andrew is so legit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so how how is that like uh, starting with him? And and uh, you said you managed community for him. Yeah, so I first started managing the Mixergy community. So he had a community of paid members who were in part of the subscription. And once you're in, you get access to all of the um, hundreds of courses and you know library of content interviews that he's done only for premium members. So, um, but the community was lacking. There was just like people who just had access to the thing, um, but not like really knowing each other or like engaging like and also this was to increase retention so um i created my own facebook group just for this community um got to know each member of mixer g and did something very similar to what i did at the hustle how, how big was, was the community at the time when you started uh a like, couple hundred members I okay think. the paid community i forgot yeah. how many um maybe like 300 or something but and then what um, was this a remote uh job or did you did you meet like did you have to move um and like be in an office with him or what how is that like yeah, this is remote. Um, luckily, we live in the Bay Area, so we got to actually meet each other um, quite often oh, um, nice. in, in like San Francisco. And we would even do like day trips to like Napa or somewhere to just go out and just ideate and have fun. And was it just um, uh, him and you, or does he did he have like a bigger team around him? Yeah, we had a team of like seven, eight people, and this team was 
the, the, he was doing remote working before it was cool. Like this, yeah. All the employees that he had weren't even employees; they were like contractors, and they all had their own different clients. And Andrew Warner and Mixergy was just one of their many clients. So we actually didn't even have any like employees. Employees. We just had maybe besides like an assistant, but like we just had a lot of people um, uh, doing very specific things, like sales page or. Uh, podcast editing, for Interesting. example. Interesting. And were, were um, you a contractor too, or were you kind of full time in the beginning? Um, yeah, I mean, I was labeled as a contractor, but I got paid a full time salary. Um, yeah. Not for the community manager stuff, but yeah. later when we transitioned to create a new, like, kind of a new business together called Bot Academy, um, that was when I like, um, like you know, made more money, and I was still under a contractor kind of thing. Um, but it didn't matter because at the time I was still under 26, which I still had health insurance yeah. under my mom. So it was it like it was all worth like it all worth it. I didn't need to fight for full time benefits if I didn't need it, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's cool, man. Um, so going back to the beginning, what what like walk us through kind of like the first couple months there of like. I'm guessing he probably set like some OKRs for you, some goals uh, that he wanted to hit, right? Did he just let you run? Uh, did he just like let you run with that, with that, and like kind of like do whatever you thought was best for the community, or did he like kind of like set specific uh, tasks he wanted you to do? Or yeah, I mean, we kind of co-created those like big overall objectives together. Yeah. Um, but in full honesty, like he kind of just trusted me. He just said, "Tam, you go do your thing." Um, and like obviously, like I would report metrics and stuff to him, and like get his approval on certain emails before I send it out. But by and large, like I was kind of like running the show, and this has kind of been like the trend for a lot of the yeah. uh, different things I've I've done. Is like the founder would just give he like I think I remember Sam telling me like Tam like Tam you are the CEO of this project of this domain yeah. like you tell me what to do. Um, and same as Andrew. Andrew, I think actually, maybe not, maybe not Sam, but Andrew was the one who told me that. Like he's like Tam, you tell me like how to better the community. I don't, I, I wouldn't know. I'm focused on, on interviewing founders. Like you tell me like what we can do for retention. Um, and he, it was very surprising to see someone who's so knowledgeable and um, you know obviously interviewed thousands of founders like want my advice. Like this 21 year old kid who's barely like got any experience. Like it was kind of humbling to to see that. Yeah, that's something I've found on my end as well, like working with Tom and Noah is like they both just like delegate to an extreme level of like, hey, like you you own this thing, like like I want you to become a master at this and like so I don't have to think about it. You know? It's kind of like like real entrepreneurs like delegate to that extent because like they really can't like when you're scaling a business and you have like like a bunch of employees, you you like you, you can only do so much, right? And so it's like if you if you kind of micromanage and like tell um, tell your employees what to do, uh, like when you have fifty employees, you're screwed, right? <laughs> so yeah, totally. I've never understand micromanaging. Like yeah. I hear about it from like my friends and corporate jobs and stuff, yeah. but I've never had that experience. I've had that exact opposite. Like they just give me all the freedom, and I'm like, I need some more structure. Like that's like <laughs> yeah. my problem sometimes. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, so so you started with community. Um, and at some point, you um, Andrew gives you like a huge step up, right? Like working on Bot Academy. Um, so can can you can you explain how that transition went? Yeah, it was kind of a lucky accident, like very similar to like the right time, right place kind of thing. Yeah, Andrew was very obsessed at the time with chatbots, and this is before it was a big thing. Now, like m- like Messenger, Facebook chatbots were like the rage at that time, um, 2017, I believe, or 18. And he wanted to be ahead of the curve. He wanted to like, so he started experimenting with all these things. He invested in a chatbot company. And so he was just, he was just playing around with it, seeing the potential. And he saw this was like going to be a big thing and he wanted, really wanted to invest his energy into it. So he kind of on a whim was like, Tam, I'm kind of obsessed with this chatbot stuff. Like, do you want to take a stab and take a look at what I've been looking on? And um, so he paid me for like two hours of research on chatbots. And I came back with this like Google Doc of ideas and all these different things that we can do. And he saw that as like a sign of interest. And he was like, do you want to lean more into this with me? I'm like, oh, yeah, heck yes. And then all of a sudden, I'm in these meetings with like these chatbot founders of like ChatFuel and ManyChat and you know all these different um, chatbot companies. And eventually, I get so good. Like I get, I get even better than Andrew. Like his has his skill level and knowledge because I had more time, especially as like a young kid. Especially like with any new topic like Bitcoin or NFT. Like the younger kid is gonna have all the time and freedom to like explore fully of that nature. Yeah. Before you know someone else who has 
a family and like other like he has a business to run um can do so when he saw that he was like Tam I think you you know we can do something here and eventually we you know uh launched a business together around bot academy and had a program that taught people how to make chatbots and then how to get clients for your to make chatbots for them so that was kind of like a wild transition over and um I love 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 working with him yeah dude that sounds awesome <laughs> it's like yeah. basically starting i mean like you're starting a business with like an entrepreneur you look up to. Like you're basically a partner, like a co-founder in this new business, right? Uh, oh, totally. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't like the co-founder per se, but I was like a, you know, the head, like the head of the <laughs> student experience and like the, you know overall, like a lot of different parts of the business. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So you, yeah. I mean, I, but I'm guessing you, you kind of were. It seemed like you were more involved with the product as well, right, and the marketing, um, right. Yeah, I mean, I was I well first I designed the course, so we 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 filmed it and designed it together, um, and then we onboarded students. So he was a sales guy, and I was the one once they got once they bought the course, I was the one guiding them through um, like this, this cohort based model. We were doing cohort based courses before it was a, a thing. Um, I mean, like it was always a thing, but now it's like much more mainstream. Yeah, um, and. Yeah, we had members going in through the modules, and we. I was also talking to the founders of ManyChat and ChatFuel because they were launching new things. This is this is like way before it's um, the landscape was developed. Like, pe- like there were so many bugs with, with all these different companies, and Facebook was changing their platform all the time. So we had like insider information of like what was happening behind the scenes and like how to prepare for that, so that when it did come out or updates came, we were the first person to. Um, uh, to like master and then teach people about it, and that was kind of like the access that people paid for for joining the company or joining the course as well. Yeah. So did a lot of all, many hats um, along the way. Yeah, that's a great niche. I mean, I remember back in the days where it was like um, like chatbots started being hot. Like you guys were like the number one resource on it, right? I think I even considered like buying the course at some point. It's like oh nice yeah, yeah yeah it was it was it was hot <laughs> like I remember I was like your your offer was like very strong oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we had a really good team and Andrew is just a, a great salesman like when you when he gets passionate about something like people feel his energy and they're like I don't know what the chatbot is but I'm gonna <laughs> take a stab at it you know yeah 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 um so um. Okay, so you're doing the chatbot stuff. I think you started getting clients on the side as well, right? I did, yeah. yeah. So I kind of used that as a vehicle, very similar to the Charlie Hone, going back to Recession Proof Graduate. Like You have an in-demand skill, and you can use that as a way to connect with other clients or talk to other people. So I started working with so many different brands. I, I leveraged the hell of that chatbot skill. Uh, I was making chatbots for free. I was getting paid for chatbots. Um, worked with like a lot of e-commerce brands like Four Sigmatic, um, and you know New York Times best-selling, bestselling authors um, working on their chatbots behind the scenes of so their book launches and stuff. So, was were you basically starting your own agency on the side as well, or? Well, I actually wasn't trying to, but I I needed as a teacher. I didn't feel confident charging so much money um, teaching this course. Um, to to students, if I wasn't a practitioner, if I wasn't out there doing the work, yeah. And I told Andrew this, and I was like, dude, like, how can we both be teaching about chatbots when we're not both building chatbots actively for members? You know, and it just felt incongruent to me. Yeah. So I told him, like, you know what, like, I need to go work and build this stuff for a real company so I can be a better teacher. So I went and found like e-commerce companies, and um, it was a lot of Andrew's friends as well who who we shout to who wanted to have a chatbot made for them. And help them out with the chatbots. So we did, you know, all everything from like A/B testing stuff to and like UTM links, and you know, it was it was really cool to see and experiment. That's so cool, man. It, it's it, it seems like almost like all the everything like fell into place, right? It's just like as you're going, um, it's like you. I mean, you're you get this huge opportunity to work on the course, right? And then you can leverage that and like Andrew's connection to kind of like build your own stuff. Like not mm-hmm. even a. I mean, it seems like at the end it was like a chatbot like agency, right? Like working with these huge brands like Four Sigmatic and yeah, it was super cool. I mean, we actually had an agency for with Bot Academy, or we try to have one. Um, but I was kind of doing it like on the side, like as a freelance person. Um, but did it get paid that much? Didn't matter. I was like, I'm gonna take the opportunity to like meet these people, and even if like I, I you know now I'm not doing any chatbots or uh, any work with chatbots, but. Now I have you know a relationship that will last you know forever. Like wherever they go in their careers, like I always have a connection to a lot of these 
different people, and some of them are like my friends now. Like they're actually like my legit friends. So um, had a really good yeah. Just said yes to all the opportunities that came my way, and um, it worked out really well. That's epic. And and then like what what really surprised me, and what I think is like really interesting about you is like you you were kind of like in a great spot, right? Um, mm-hmm. Like uh, like kind of like the peak, <laughs> like kind of like like really in a good spot career wise, like personal wise, like business wise. Uh, and then you decide you decide to kind of like take a sabbatical, uh, or not even like an indefinite sabbatical, right? And like go yeah. go teach chess, or like kind of go focus on like learning and teaching chess, right? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad. I mean, I'm glad you did all the research. So this has been <laughs> awesome so far. Um, yeah, I mean, I was doing really well. Like opportunities were coming to me left and right. It felt like I was a hot girl at a bar, and I never felt this way in a long, <laughs> a long time. Um, so it felt really invigorating and kind of like motivating um, to see uh, so much interest. After in the beginning, me cold emailing people, begging them for me to do free work for them. So what a contrast! And I remember tra- like I was actually working remotely while working at Bot Academy and working with these different clients. Um, I was trying to live that digital nomad life. Yeah. And I was, in in Asia for a little bit, and I remember being in a cafe in Chiang Mai, just obsessively watching chess lectures um, on on YouTube. Uh, like these, these are like two hour lectures, and I was watching like one after the other after uh-huh. the other. And I, my friend was like, "Tam, like you're in you know other side of the world. Why are you on your laptop watching like chess videos? It's so <laughs> boring and so weird." But at that time, it felt really right. Yeah. Um, it was, this is a curiosity I've always wanted to explore for a long time, but um, there was never like that right time to like really dive into chess because I, when I was in high school, I was an average player. But and to get to the next level, you had to like dedicate a lot of time to study and to do drills and to you know learn about the game yeah. and um, perfect your craft. And I didn't have that time, and I wanted you know I was seventeen. I wanted to date women. I would date girls. I wanted to like go have fun and like you know go party and all these things. So when I was in Asia, I don't know why, but just being away from everybody, having all my work, being in a different time zone, I was like, had so much time to like do stuff, um, whatever I, I wanted. And my curiosity just naturally led me to chess. Like it was like a pull, not a push. Like it was, just, I was just calling towards it. And, and I even like brought my laptop in like to get a time massage, like to get a foot massage. They would massage my feet and I'm just yeah, like watching, watching chess. <laughs> watching like Var Kobe and, you know, teaching me about the Queen's Gambit decline. Like it was amazing. Um, and I'm curious, and, at, at that time, were you kind of like, did you kind of feel um, unsatisfied with your work? Like, were you like a little, um, yeah, were you uh, like getting a little unsatisfied or kind of like less motivated with the work because like you kind of knew already like everything, like you weren't growing as much? Is that the position you were in? Or Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you asked this because I remember getting a contract from one of an author that I uh, really wanted to work with. I, I kind of like idolized this guy and he sent me this contract. I signed it, and I'm like, wow, this is what I've been dreaming. This is what I've been thinking about since I dropped out of college, like, or even like on the way to college. Like, this is like the like the dream. Yeah. And then I signed it, and then I and guess what? It's just it's just work. It, it's 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 just another job with another client. It's nothing crazy special. We didn't have any like one on one FaceTime or whatever it is. Like, it was just a job. And I realized at this point I was like, wow, like this ladder that I was climbing or this mountain that I was like kind of journeying up. Yeah. Like wasn't I thought I wanted this. I really thought that this was like my dream. And once I reach this, I'll be happy. And I wasn't ecstatic. I, it was a cool opportunity, but it wasn't anything extravagant or crazy. And so that kind of led me down the self-reflection path of like, man, what do I actually want? It seems weird, but I actually really want to play chess right now. Like this. Like this entrepreneur stuff, like doesn't interest me as much as it once used to, um, and I think it's after because of like kind of going back to my first quote, like clarity comes with action. Yeah. So I got a lot more clarity on like what I want to do in my life, and um, I felt like at that moment in my in in my career in my life, it wasn't business anymore. Like I've kind of reached that ladder. Not that like I'm like I don't, like, not that I know everything or, or whatnot, but it didn't feel right. And that's why I said chess like kind of pulled me to it. I didn't hunt for it. It kind of pulled me to it. And I just leaned in when your gut tells you to. Dude, that, that's so awesome. Because I think, I think a, a lot of people have like those interests that they want to explore more. And kind of, but, it, but that stays kind of like a fantasy, right? Where it's like, oh, it's like, it's like no one does that, you know? It's like no one, can, yeah. no one actually goes and like uh, quits their job to like pr- pursue like something like that. So like, I'm curious, 
what, was it a hard decision for you, or was it just like did it make sense? Did you just, uh, um, yeah, was it easy? Was it hard or easy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I hate saying this, but it's a bit of both. You know, it yeah. was hard to like, you know, not have income for, yeah. for example, and not and like have have this lifestyle where I'm just doing chess, but. It felt easy in that, like it was like so logical. Like it's very similar to dropping out of college. Like it wasn't easy to do it, but it felt so logical to me to like do it because of all these reasons. And um, yeah, like and especially when you look at it from a grand perspective, like like a thirty thousand foot view. What other time in my life will I ever take a year off to study chess? Yeah, maybe not ever. Maybe this is like out of the prime times to do anything. This is like the prime time and. Especially when I, I used to think that, you know, I was felt behind in life and like other people on different schedules and stuff. But I realized that, you know what, everyone's on their own journey. There's, there are no rules. Like people make up all these, like you have to get married by 30 and have a kid so by true. this and whatever. There's no rules, man. <laughs> so true. Yeah. I, I'm just curious, like, you, because you were in this great spot, were you scared? Like, oh, like if I quit, like, oh, like I'm going to quit my job with Andrew, I'm going to quit all these clients. Like, like after it's going to be like impossible to get that. Like, did you have those thoughts of like, oh, it's like, I'm kind of like ruined these relationships, you know? I mean, not ruining really, it because like, obviously you're, I'm sure you left in good terms, but it's like, yeah. like kind of like that fear of uh, missing out, you know, or that fear of like losing, losing that job, you know? Yeah. I mean, surprisingly, not really. Yeah. Like I was actually not even worried about like the relationships, yeah. but I was worried more about like when I go back to work, what am I going to do next? Because I've already done like the growth stuff. I've already done digital marketing stuff. Like, what what do I want to do next? Um, and is it community building? Is it event planning? Like, I didn't really have a plan. I was just along the way, I was just doing things that excited me. Like, I never expected to be like a chatbot practitioner, but I was that was one of my many, you know, different part of my jobs. So that, I was more worried about that part. But in terms of the relationship and stuff, like, we left on really good terms. Um, and a lot of the contracts that I did have were like, Ended or how we're short term anyways, so yeah. um, it all kind of lined up like perfectly. The only big thing that was like the the one that we had to like have a conversation about was with Andrew Warner, and that was like you know a conversation that not everyone looks forward to, but that's something that we have to do. And I think it was at that time as well where I I, I think I do this a lot with a lot of the things I uh, work on is I build everything up, I create systems around it, and then at a certain point it's automated, so. Like he doesn't need me as much as he once did. Like the the course was now in like his third iteration. We had a system of onboarding new people. We had a sales page. We had all these things. We had a a ten thousand person community on Facebook that was like kind of managing itself um, with different moderators that that I you know place and stuff. And so I kind of like hired myself out of a job. Nice. And so I could have like Andrew was very open to. It. He was like Aunt Tam, like you know, let's talk about. A new thing that you want to do if if you want that, but if you don't, like it's that's fine. But just we should have a conversation because you know you're getting paid for all this work. Uh, he paid for the work they used to do, which was very valuable then. But now it might not be like the equally compensated for both of us. And I'm like, yeah, that makes total sense. And I told him like, you know what? Like, surprising or not, like I think I'm gonna do this chess journey. Um, and he was totally receptive and obviously like a, a huge you know uh, supporter and fan of and friend um, to this day. That's awesome, man. And what what I like about um, the way you kind of went into this journey is like you didn't just like uh, you just you didn't just like jump into it, but it seems like you kind of planned it out as far as like your like like income wise as well. Like first of all, I'm sure you had some savings, but it seems like you set up. uh, You basically were like, oh, like how can I make this work, right? And then you went out, reached out to different like chess schools, and basically like became a tutor, right? Yeah, basically. I mean, in full honesty, I also ran out of income <laughs> like um, during the chess journey. But I was talking to my coach at the time, and we basically had a limit of like, okay, Tam, when you know what, when you hit this amount in your bank account, um, that is when you're going to go find a job. And and according to your runway, that's going to be in seven months. So, for, so like now that I had that all planned out, and I had some security of like, okay, I know what to expect. Um, I can just focus all my energy in the seven months, just focus on chess and just being present. Um, what, what, was the plan, had, what was the plan? What was the plan? Like at the end of like, were you trying to go like pro, or, or was it just like, oh, this is just like a temporary thing? Like I'm gonna do chess, and then and then I'll figure out like what's next. Yeah, I mean specifically with chess, 
my only goal was how far can I go? How far can I push myself uh-huh. to like the highest potential? I mean, people can do this for weightlifting or for sports. To me, my medium was chess, and it taught me so much outside of chess that you know was really like motivating, for, like for me as like a personal growth addict. You know, like I, I just love push myself in that journey, putting myself in the arena. And I don't know if you know this, but like chess like players like lose like thousands of calories when they play in the world championships or these big tournaments wow. because. It's as if like you're like getting punched in the face, like and getting beat up. Like it's like it's the same feeling of like the fight and flight, fight or flight feeling, where your heart is pounding in certain positions and, and stuff. So um, that was like me. Like I was really trying to push myself like to my potential, um, and I felt like I gone like I. It was important for me not to have an external goal. Like people like to want to be a master or whatever at chess and. I'm like, dude, people want to be the noun before the verb. Like they want to be the master before the chess play, like playing chess, you know, or um, studying chess. So I just wanted to do my best and, and study. And, and very fortunately, I had some really good tournaments and I was just so full, so locked in. It, it felt really like invigorating, like to be on hour three of a tournament game and just like crush um, my opponent. <laughs> it felt really good. That's awesome. Yeah, that sounds fun, man. Uh, it sounds fun, and also just like I, I feel like uh, this could be like a documentary or, or, or YouTube video. You know, it's like if, if if you had documented all of that, you know, it's like the perfect kind of like, hey, like I, I like basically my like kind of the end goal of like beating like a grand chess master or something like that. You know, it's like it's really cool that oh, you yeah. actually took seven months out and like seems like hired a coach. Did like like basically scheduled in like deliberate practice time every day to kind of like study the greats and practice, 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 going to tournaments. You know, it's 100%. It, it, it almost makes me think of like, uh, have you seen that documentary, Pumping Iron? No, I haven't. Uh, like, it's like a bodybuilding documentary with uh, like the kind of like falls like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It kind of makes me think of that oh, for wow. some reason. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I totally could do a YouTube video one day. I yeah. did a medium post about it. Um, yeah, at that moment, I was like very against, like not against, but like I was just trying to be present. It makes and sense. It makes not photograph everything. It would have um, taken away I, from the experience, probably. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people do things for the video, or for the photos, but yeah. I was like, I mean, I think it's possible to do both. Don't get me wrong, but I think at that moment, I was just really focused on like doing my best, and <laughs> that was going to be a distraction. So, um, I I would. Totally consider making a YouTube video one day. I think it'll do really well, especially given the popularity of chess right now. Yeah. Um, but not a priority, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. No. Or fortunately. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you What do you take out of the whole experience? Like, what you came out like seven months later. Like, what What were the main? Like, how do you think this um, This affected your life um, after post yeah. experiment. I mean, one. I like. So I like. I love surprising myself. I used to look at these masters and be like, wow, they're God, they're invincible. And then I would play these experts and these masters, and I'm like, I'm kind of hanging in there. And I was like, oh, wow, like, these are actually just human beings. Um, and then later, like, I actually beat experts, and then I actually beat a national master. And I was like, holy sh, I had no, like, if you would have told me seven months before I would beat a national master in a classical rated game, in games where it's like hours long, it's not like the fun three minute stuff that you, you see Noah play on, on chess.com or yeah. whatever. Like, it's, it's like a real long ass game. Um, I would have like told myself like that would that would be crazy, but I went and did it. So one, surprising myself. Two, I had a block um, of always like playing it safe. So usually in a position where you're winning, you want to push and go for the win. But however, when I played against like higher rated opponents, I and they would and I'd be in a winning position, uh, and they would offer me a draw. Um, and at any point, any player can offer um, the, the other player a draw, and if they accept, then it's a draw. It's a half half. Um, so I could either accept the draw, or I can go push for the win, and you know maybe lose, but like maybe win as well. So, but I had a block where I always accepted the draw because I was just focused on rating points. I was like I wanted my rating to go up, and if I got a draw against a higher rated opponent, my rating would go up. And then I remember going to a tournament. It was an all day tournament. I played three games um, for like two hours each, three hours each, and three draws. And I drove home from San Jose to San Francisco, like which is an hour long drive. And I was like shooting myself in the foot. I was like, why am I driving all this way, waking up early and training to just freaking go for a draw? Like this makes no sense. Um, And I was really mad at myself. And I talked with my coach, unsurprisingly, and we talked about like what is blocking me from like getting for the win. And I'm just like 
like any, like everyone else, I'm scared of failing. I'm scared of like looking dumb. I'm scared of like having a winning position and like having it crumble. Um, and so a draw would be just be easier for me to sit with. But I was like, you know what? I need to like find my edge and I need to push myself for the win. Yeah. Um, and so that's like one of the other things that I that I did. And um, you know, I I just try to like. I had to like be okay with failing and like losing. That sounds so cliche, but it was really like me putting myself on the line and like getting punched in the face, jab, jab, like, you know, uh, and you know, really going for it. And I lost a lot and I also won a couple. So it was all worth it for me. So and I learned a couple more things, but those are the two main ones that that stick out for now. Yeah, it's funny how like challenges like that, or, like personal challenges, regardless, like whether it's in sports, chess, you know. Um, I like outside of work will kind of uh, like will always teach you lessons where it's like um, you, you take something from it and like apply it to the rest of your life as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I actually personally, I see business as like a chess game. Like, so yeah. when I, I'm now doing operations for Mastermind Talks or MMT and the whole the whole business strategy, you know, everything about it is like a chess game. We're just moving pawns. We're moving, you know, we have a queen, we have a king. You know, we have different strategies on how to do things. I see it, business as a whole chess game, uh, which makes it easy for me to like, you know, have analogies to like different things and make sense of what's happening when there's a lot of chaos going on. So I guess that's like the main worldview that I have. I think most people don't see, you know, their life in a sixty-four square board, but I I, I see everything very clearly in this in this <laughs> um, set of circumstances. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And and another thing I feel like is like. You had, I mean, you kind of had that itch, right? And it's like you were able to scratch that itch, so that like now you're like, yeah, I did that, you know. And like, it's not something in the back of your mind that like stays a fantasy, you know. It's like, oh, I did oh that, you know, I tried it, and it's like now I'm on to the next chapter. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. I'm all about like if something scares me, like that. That makes me more excited to like go do it. Yeah. Because to I, I have had so much personal growth and opportunity from things that I'm scared about, like dating. Dancing, um, going, loving myself, and going to therapy. Like, like, yeah, yeah. I, I actually did all the hard work and like went into, you know, a therapy session or whatever it is, and like, like looked at the box and like opened it and see what's inside. Like, what's the story that I'm holding? Um, what can I do to like make some progress to to get better? And um, yeah, chess was definitely a medium for it, and many other things in my life. So that's hopefully how I want to live the rest of my life. It's just kind of leaning into those fears and reaping a lot of the. Like personal rewards, not just the external stuff, but like the, like and really like rewarding, like it's what this is what makes life beautiful for me at least. Um, and I think yeah, you might relate to to some or a lot of that. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I love that man. Um, mm. So you you get to the end of the seven months, right? Um, yeah. What what was that transition like? Um, like were you were you running out of money? Um, what what was like what was going through your mind and were you um were you, do you feel like you kind of were like rushed out of chess where it's like oh shit like now I have to make an income you know or were you like were you able to like tie a bow on that chapter and be like okay like I'm ready now like I had my fun um I'm ready to mm-hmm. like move on to the next chapter and then what was that transition like into your next job yeah well definitely the latter it felt like I did all that I could like beating national master that is a huge accomplishment on my on its own. And I was at a point where I was at like a two thousand rated level, so that's like a chess expert. Damn. Um, and to get to the next level, it takes an even extraordinary amount of time to get to like twenty one hundred or twenty two hundred. Um, like you needed five more years. Was, <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. And I was like, shoot. Like, I think I'm better than like ninety five percent of like all chess ranked players. So I feel like I'm I'm good. I think I've done enough of my duty here um, to like really feel proud of myself and like to give it the best go that I can. Um, without wanting to sacrifice other parts of my life that I was like leaning more into. So the transition was I was running out of money. I even had to borrow money because the job searching took longer than expected. But I posted a Facebook status saying, like, hey guys, I'm hey everyone, I'm looking for my next opportunity um, for careers. Here is what I've done. Here's what I want to do or the areas I want to f- uh, do uh, like focus on. Do you know anyone or are you hiring? Like I was just like an open call. And holy shit, I got so many messages that say, that day. It really felt like I was a hot girl, an even hotter girl at that bar. Like it, was, <laughs> it was absolutely insane, and I didn't realize how much like social capital I had. Um, like like Jason actually, Jason Gaynor, the the, the work, guy I worked with, he reached out to me saying like, "Hey, if you ever want to move to Canada, like please let me know." I'm like, "Holy, sh- this is the guy I've been following and listening to his podcast for for years," and I didn't even know I was on his radar. Um, but 
you know, I'll get to him in a minute, but a lot of other people were messaging me and I felt very flattering. And I had so many phone calls lined up for that couple of weeks um, to see what was my next fit. And, and truth be told, like I didn't know what, to, what I wanted to do. Um, and my friend was very like thoughtful and well intentioned. He was like, Tam, like, you know, if you take this job with Jason, like, what do you want to do? Are you gonna be like a community builder or an event planner for the rest of your life? Like, you know, and he was actually persuading me to take this like digital like growth marketing role. He's like, Tam, take this role, use it, and then you have your own growth marketing blog, and then you have your own course. You know, he was kind of thinking like a more safer option for me and a more like secure option. But I was like, you know what, this this opportunity with Jason to start a community in of entrepreneurs in Toronto, um, you know, Canada, like it's three thousand miles away from me or whatever it is, like um, that sounded exciting to me. Mm-hmm. And my gut was telling me, like, oh gosh, I need to go with Jason. Like, I don't even know what this job is, but please, like, this felt right. Um, and so I listened to my gut again of like, this is gonna be the next big move for me. And luckily, all the stars worked out because if he didn't work out, truth be told, like, I wouldn't have had many amazing options. I would have had like decent options um, that I was like okay about, but this one was one that I was like really like like crossed my fingers for, and I'm so fortunate that everything worked out um, because I would have to be facing a, a real edge again if I if it didn't because I would yeah I would have to choose a job that may not be the most fulfilling or the most you know aligned to what my my passions or potential is. Yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy that like most people when they want a job they just like. It's usually like you go out and you search for a job, right? But it's like kind of cool um, that you kind of like got like a lot of inbound requests just through a post, right? It felt so nice, and this is the relationship I built for for years. Um, I've, they noted me for years. They've seen my progress with the hustle, Andrew Warner. You know, they see my my zest for life. Yeah. Um, I think that's the real thing. It's like they 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 see my energy, and who wouldn't want? I mean, I don't want to be so egotistical, but who wouldn't want like an eager like Ambitious person who's like has really high integrity and respect to like work for them. Like I don't know, like it's uh, it's kind of a no brainer for for in my eyes. Oh um, yeah. And I was so lucky to ha- you know put myself in a position to be there, like to have that. Because in the beginning, it was like the complete opposite. It was like me reaching out to like thirty people <laughs> and begging people for me to to work for them. Yeah. It, are were those all connections that you? You you built like throughout like while you were working there and kind of like hanging out around all these like interesting people like at the dinners at the uh, like around Andrew Warner and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. totally. Um, I I met all these people and also what the biggest trick is that once you're friends with a super connector like Andrew Warner, he's interviewed like, every single founder on the block. So even just mentioning his name or saying you work closely with him, like yeah. it's already a huge boost in your reputation. Yeah, and so even with Jason Gaynard too, like he's. Uh, Markedly, even more well connected than Andrew um, in other spaces, and I know that like I don't plan to leave anytime soon. But like, if I ever do decide to um, work somewhere else, like I feel very confident that Jason will give me a glowing recommendation, and uh, you know he would probably introduce me to the next person um, that I would work with. So th- that just speaks to like who I work with, and I, not not everyone is as as lucky to be with, with a super connector. But that was somewhat strategic, like long term, like. Being around these people who are just so well connected. Yeah, it's like you get access to the personal network. Um, oh yeah, like yeah. same with you and Noah or Tom. Like yeah, you know. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, that's amazing, man. And so how? Yeah. Uh, so you moved to Canada for this, right? What? Why did it feel right? Because like it seems like you, um, you, you, you didn't want to do like the the community stuff anymore, right? At the time. Uh, or let let me know if that that wasn't correct. But then, like going back into this, you're like, oh, this felt right, even though it's like not uh, the area I um, I particularly want to go into. Yeah. Well, a couple things felt right. One, moving to Canada um, felt right. Like I I visited Toronto twice before, uh-huh. and I remember visiting and sitting on like or standing on this cross, this busy intersection, and I was on a beautiful summer day, and I like fell in love like. Ten times, like on that, on that <laughs> week, and I was like, I need to like, li- I can. I said to myself, I can totally see myself living here one day, um, not knowing that I ever would live there. Yeah. Um. So that was like a big pull. Um. And also, I was getting so comfortable in Toronto. I mean, in San Francisco, like, I was gonna, I was about to take on another 
very secure growth marketing kind of job um, and working remotely and doing my thing. And I was like, dude, I need a change. Like, I, I'm too comfortable here. Um, so that felt right as well. And also, lastly but not least, is working with Jason. Like, I didn't know what we're going to be working on because um, he was starting this new thing. But man, like, to be connected with him and to learn from him, like, that was what I was most drawn to. Um, and then the actual work was quite interesting. Like I didn't, I, I, I now host like really great dinners. Um, I host really great in-person workshops before, you know, pre-COVID. And it was like a ton of fun to like learn from from Jason. Um, and now we're, we've shifted a little bit. So now we're um, mostly virtual, but it was uh, like all those factors felt right. And I honestly didn't think too far ahead of like, what's five years now going to look like? And honestly, that's, I don't think that's even the right question to ask. But I think... I, from my gut, like from my experience, I've always gone with what's exciting to me and where I, where I can learn from the most or what feels right. And luckily, that's been my gut has usually t- pointed me in the right direction. Yeah, dude, the gut is huge. Like I was reflecting on this the other day of like, like whenever, like if you if you look, if I look back at like the big decisions I've made, it like I never had to think about it much. It was always just like like I knew yeah. it was right, and then like you kind of. I'm, you seem kind of like a, a pretty logical guy as well. I was like, you kind of rationalize your gut like on paper, but it's like yeah. the decision is already made, you know? <laughs> 100%. It. Yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. Nice. So you're pr- pretty much like a, pro- it seems like a professional like uh, networker, you know, like event organizer with uh, with Jason, which sounds really cool. And then you, um, like during COVID, uh, you you kind of got promoted in a way to kind of set up this uh, this uh, I mean to manage a transition uh, to digital, right? Can you talk about that and uh, the role specifically? I'm curious, like um, the role of the integrator. That, that seems very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to share all this stuff because it was so interesting. I didn't know the integrator was even a job. Yeah. So I'm I'm still learning all this stuff. Right? Yeah. Um, in the beginning, Jason had this beautiful community called Mastermind Talks, or short for MMT. And once a year, they hosted a three-day live. And he's known for like his amazing curation of people, the amazing programming that he's done, and all the little touches of the experience that make people, you know, he like his last event sold out, 10k a ticket, um, months in advance without no agenda, no speakers announced. It's just all sold out because of his reputation of doing um, MMT for so long. And what he really wanted to do was like launch this thing called Catalyst Community in Toronto because they come together for MMT for three amazing days, and then for the rest of the year they're kind of like, see you later. Like there's a there's a Facebook group, but you know, how close can you get on Facebook? Um, like that's what we thought beforehand. So we wanted to make a very localized community and have like like three to four dinners and workshops and fireside chats a month on different people in the city. And then we were going to have a chapter in Toronto and Vancouver and, you know, Denver and all these, and Austin and all these other places. Like that's kind of our vision. And he, and Jason needed someone to lead this operation. And that, I didn't even know how to do all of that stuff, but that felt very exciting to me. Like that vision of like signing these chapters and um, building relationships with people in the city. Um, So I was really leading into that. But then unfortunately, uh, we had a good amount of people, like 30 or so people signed up for our first cohort. And then COVID hit, like right when that first year was about to start. So all of our calendars, our restaurants, all the fireside chats that we booked and speakers and stuff all got canceled. Which, and we had to quickly shift everything online. And we had these things called brain trust, where like damn. there were six person facilitated like mastermind groups. And we had all this, you know, grand plans of like, how to you know I you know I went to like a lot of training around facilitation and and experience design to do a really good job for this brain trust offering, uh, but we moved all online too, and so like how can we create a safe space uh, with deep connection and like get people to cry and share openly virtually like that's a, I, that's a whole other challenge. So during this transition, um, uh, we were like you know what we can't mm-hmm. do catalysts anymore like this pandemic is not letting up anytime soon, like we just can't do it. And so what we did was we merged the two communities together. So now Catalyst people are now MMT people and they're all one big MMT family. And instead of um, having one experience a year and saying see you later for three for the rest of the year, um, for the 362 days, um, we now had one membership and then everything else was an add-on. So if you wanted to be in brain trust, that's add-on to the base membership. If you wanted to go to a live experience, that's a base membership. Um, and But not the other way around. It used to be the event first and then everything else kind of an add-on. But 
the membership was first. So we had like our um, Thinkific library of all the past uh-huh. talks that we've done for MMT. We've had, the, you know, obviously the community forum. We've had other initiatives. Like we have a live virtual events called MMT at Homes. They're day-long sessions, just like MMT, except now they're uh, happening much more frequently throughout the year uh, and from the uh, comfort of your own home. So we shifted a lot of that stuff to this virtual because of COVID. Um, and a lot of event planners had to do that adjustment. And I got promoted doing this, which was quite quite crazy because, uh, you know, most people are getting fired and stuff. And I was like, man, this is freaking awesome. And an integrator, to answer your question, is um, basically the visionary's right-hand man. So yeah. the visionary is the one who's like the ambassador of the company, setting the vision for where we're going um, and kind of steering the ship. And the integrator is the one making all of it happen. So I was promoted to be the integrator to one, like hire a new team on doing all these different programmings. I was the one to set up Basecamp, uh, which is our impl- like our software and all the systems that we do on Basecamp, how to document our processes. Um, and I was the one leading uh, EOS, which is like an operating system that we run on, um, very similar to like Rockefeller Habits, if you're familiar, or um, other things. But um, we had like, you know, EOS sessions where we had our level 10 mm-hmm. weekly meetings and our quarterly planning. Like I would lead all that stuff. So quite a whole different role. I know that was a lot of information, so I'll kind of just stop there and, you know, I <laughs> pause for a sec. But yeah, it was quite a transition um, and, and quite fun, and f- quite frankly. Yeah, that sounds like a, an amazing opportunity. And for anyone that's interested in like finding out more about like the integrator role, I think there's a book called uh, Rocket Fuel, right? I haven't read it yet, but uh, I've heard. Like, yeah, Rocket Fuel. Tom, Tom exactly. was a big fan. I think Tom read it a while back, and he was like, "Yeah, we need we need an integrator here at, at Impact Theory as well." So he oh started started started. I helped him actually like started hiring like a COO like started that. So it kind of kind of got put on hold during COVID just because like revenue was like a little uncertain, right? And it's like this is like a high salaried person we wanted to bring in. Um, yeah. But but yeah, it's fascinating. Um, um, and Noah's hiring a CEO too, or something, or maybe not a CEO, but something yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, <laughs> if anyone listening knows any referrals, we're offering a hundred thousand dollar bounty. So <laughs> just, that's wild. Yep, CEO at appsimo.com If you have a referral, <laughs> um, yeah, that's uh, it, it, it's crazy because like it, it, this this seems like it's like the second project where it's like you were. Involved from the ground up, right? And this this time, um, probably even more responsibilities. How, how big was the team um, that, that you ended up building, or how how big is the team today that you ended up building? Yeah, I mean, hundred percent what you said about building from the ground up. It was just like a whole new startup again. And currently, the team is five people, including myself and Jason. So very small team. We have yeah. a couple of freelancers here and there too that I'm not counting, but um, yeah, quite small. But I mean, regardless, <laughs> it's like you, you you built all the systems in that team, right? So that's that's really cool. Um, yeah, I had to like read books for the first time about how to be a manager and like you know how how to connect. You know, I mean, all of it came very intuitively because I yeah. you know build relationships with communities and stuff. And building a team is not d- too drastically different. Um, but then again, like you know, uh, yeah, it was just it was just a new learning experience for me. I never expected to be a manager when I took this job. But I'm saying yes, an opportunity. It kind of spoke to me, and I was like, "Let's explore and see." Yeah, yeah, yeah. The common thing I notice is like, like you being an entrepreneur. You know, is like, mm-hmm. like uh, just seeing the opportunities and seizing them when they're there. And uh, you're not just like an employee. You're you're you really act as an owner, uh, which is really cool. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Especially at a small startup, and I think honestly, like I don't know why people aren't doing this more often because I'm getting paid to learn. I mean, I'm working, of course, but like, I'm learning from like the the coolest people <laughs> that you know people read about and listen to and watch. like. I think it's just so fun. Um, so yeah, it's a hell of a, and I'm still going on this journey. Yeah. So wh- where uh, where are you at, where are you at now? And um, what's what's your let's say like your ten year plan? Like what uh, if you have any? Some people have one, some people don't. Um, yeah. But like, where do you, where do you see the future heading? I mean, I totally see myself in like 10 years having my own business. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm already starting a program right now, or actually, ironically, around leaning into your fears. Um, I don't know what the title or all this stuff is qu- quite yet, but 
Um, I plan to like have my own course and programs and stuff like that around personal growth and transformation. So that's like kind of like the area that I'm leading towards in. And who knows? I can have a course on community. I can have a course on um, hosting digital events because um, I've freaking learned so much about it and, and had so much training. So that's definitely where I see myself in the long term. Yeah, as the an educator term, as well, it seems like, right? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I we didn't even mention it beforehand, but like I wrote two books around helping people network and helping people land their dream internship. So, and I have a blog that I write on every every month. So, um, I I love teaching. I love writing and just communicating. Really, um, and this podcast has been really fun. So, thank you for inviting me. Um, and yeah, and then for the short term, I'm still working at MMT. I'm actually ironically in a transition right now because I'm no longer going to be like the true integrator role. I'm going to have some of those. Our responsibilities, but my my role is shifting now that the company has shifted. Like we have our team, we have EOS, we have um, all the thing, like all the systems kind of done. I, ironic that I work myself out of a job again. So now my I <laughs> that's know, the best, right? That's what that's what everyone should aim of. Like that's when you know you've done your 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 job right. Yeah, it feels good. Like I, my team, the team is awesome. And yeah, yeah Jason was like. You know what, Tan? Like you did, you were so valuable at this time, at this juncture. But now, like we don't need that stuff as much as anymore. We need actually more people in this role. Which now, yeah. my new role is going to be this next quarter, is um, around back to community building, um, nurturing some of the people who were past, like alumni of MMT or friends, second of degree connections, or people who've nominated other members. And I'll kind of be like the salesperson to kind of bridge them to actually join the community because we have so many nominations that. Um, other people want people to be part of the community, just not enough time to like build a relationship with each and every person. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of funny. I'm doing kind of what I was doing at the hustle way back in the day for a new role in a new company um, in a different, uh, slightly different environment. So it all comes full circle, and uh, and I'm like doing programs and teaching and, and speaking again and writing again, just like I was doing in high school um, and in college. So. I, yeah, it's it's just funny how things come full circle, like I said, and uh, how your childhood passion and stuff like really don't die. That's super cool. That's that's awesome. For anyone, I like to break down. Like I've had um, I had like I think thirteen guests on so far, and it, like everyone has like a slightly like different skill set, right? And for you, it really and like. It's mostly people that have worked behind the scenes, like directly, like you, like right hand man of like an entrepreneur or something like that. And I love to identify those different skills. Uh, that like, if people, if someone is interested in going to work behind the scenes, like what are the skills that you can pick up for yourself um, to kind of like assist these entrepreneurs, right? So if someone's like listening to this, uh, let's say in high school or like wants to drop out of college <laughs> and go work with an entrepreneur. Um, how 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 would you go about it if someone wants to help an entrepreneur with community building? I mean, take it from you and me. Like, just literally go out and do some of the work um, and read Recession Proof Graduate first of all, <laughs> yeah. and then develop that skill set. Either start in your own community. Like, I didn't even talk about this in the in this podcast, but I had my own meetup group for James Altucher's uh, Choose Yourself book. So oh, I hosted wow. a meetup every month um, for a year. Uh, in San Francisco, um, for all the people who've read James Altucher, and he would send me like a hundred of his books to like give out to people, and so, like you know, I was doing that stuff like on my own for free without any work. And so when I went to the hustle, I said, "Hey, I did this meetup group already. Like I've had some experience with community building. Like I'm yeah. not an expert at all, but people like, especially when you're young in high school and college, people just want to see like enthusiasm. They want to see drive. They want to see your zest. They want to just see your curiosity. And whatever you do, like." It won't even matter. Like they won't even care if it's like high quality or not. Like they just care that you're like learning, you're leaning in, you're having fun, you're working hard. Um, like and like I told you in Dallas, like I was working. I was the first one there at like seven, six thirty a.m. and leaving at like eight p.m. Like yeah. And I don't encourage everyone to like do the Gary Vaynerchuk hustle life, but like yeah, yeah. dude, I, at that moment in my life, like that was like what I wanted to do, and it felt yeah. really right to me. So yeah, read the book, read Charlie Hone's book. Go out and do the things that you want to do for clients, but just do it on your own time. Like if you want to write for other people, like write your own blog. Um, it's as simple as that. And just get the reps in. Um, it's not going to be perfect. It's it's going to be quite bad actually. But uh, it's, the more you do it, the more you'll like get recognized. And honestly, the more people 
who see your potential, um, they'll take a chance on you. Like Sam took a chance on me because I had this like college rejection video that I filmed that kind of got viral on Facebook. I mean, viral was like a, a couple thousand, ten, like twenty thousand views. Hell but yeah. Sam saw it. He tagged his co-founder and was like, "Look at this kid who volunteered at our hustle con." Um, and he that was one of the reasons why he's he wanted to hire me was because he saw that kind of drive. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I. I I'll second that. Like side projects for me is like the most. It's like the most underrated thing as far as like getting a job, right? It's like 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 start like basically identify the job that you're interested in, you know, and then start a side project of like what you would be doing that position. And it's like that that puts you in front of like ninety nine percent of like the other applicants, right? Because like it's that like given they if they don't have experience, right? It's like. It's like this basically makes you. It's it, it's kind of like a line on your resume, right? It's like makes you the perfect fit for that job. Oh, one hundred percent, man. Yeah. Um, I actually have this exact thing in my book, um, "How to Land Your Dream Internship." There's like the front door. You go through the application process. Yeah. There's a side door where you know you kind of have a friend who knows who knows somebody, and then you have like the creative approach where. You literally do your own side hustle, or like this woman made this like website just for Airbnb as like her hiring application. Um, she actually didn't get hired at Airbnb, but she got like twenty other offers from other companies who see who this website portfolio went viral because she like imitated exactly Airbnb style and like saw a gap of where they wanted to go or what they weren't capitalizing on, and she kind of shared her thoughts on it. So yeah, like most people don't do this, and even if we say this. Most people listening won't do this, um, and that's okay. Like you know, that's their fault. I mean, if they, they don't want it bad enough, then that's fine. But yeah. for those who are listening and who like want to take some action, like be that random person who cold emails somebody. Like even if it's a bad email, like dude, a lot of people don't get a lot of cold emails. Like believe yeah. it or not, um, it's or as easier. Much as you think they do. It's easier than you think to like get in touch with these people. <laughs> oh, so easy. I mean, yeah. you're a living example of this too, right? So it's just. I don't know who else you had on this podcast, but like I'm sure, like a simple message of saying like, "Hey, you impacted my life. Thank you. That's yeah, it. Don't yeah. even have to say anything else." And you've already like are ahead of 99 of the people who maybe want that same position or whatever it is. And like you said, if you want a guaranteed response, like the step to go further is like like reach out in the creative way, right? Like I like I have a friend who got like ended up getting a job with like Mr. Beast, um, oh, like nice. running his like philanthropy channel by making a music video, like kind of like pitching himself like in a creative way, which ended oh, wow. up like going viral on Twitter. And like Is that the Asian guy? Uh, my, yeah, Michael Lim. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. cool. I saw that video. Saw, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I tagged him and said, hey, good luck, man. I don't know if this is going to work, but... <laughs> uh, hell yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it worked? It worked. He, he got a job. He's, he's running the Beast Philanthropy uh, channel now. Wow, that's yeah. really freaking awesome. What a, what a cool case study. Yeah, man, I'll, I'll introduce you guys um, at some point. Like, I think I think you guys would would get along. He also used to have like a newsletter and stuff. So, oh yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. But good for him, man. I saw the video. and I was like, man, this is impressive. Like a lot of effort. I have no idea if Mr. Beast is gonna respond to this, but he did. You, yeah, you took a shot, man. Like, yeah, um, that's that's more than you know. And that video wasn't even like it didn't take him like a million dollars to make that. Right? Yeah. right? You know what I mean? Like it, oh, so good. So it much just, effort. For yeah, like, you know, like not that much effort for a lot of reward. Like it's yep. it's crazy. Yeah, hundred percent, man. <laughs> um, so you mentioned a newsletter uh, and the books. Where where can people find those uh, online? Yeah, I mean, you can go to my website at tamfam.co, or you can look at me up on Amazon. Um, and I have my program coming out soon. I'm not sure what it's going to be called yet. So if you have a name, you know, please let me know, Jeremy. But um, it's going to be around like leaning into your fears um, and kind of everything what I said about. Chess and my experience with dancing and, and dating and, and all these things. Like I got very much like leading to these fears, went in and like said I'm scared, but I'm gonna go do it. And I went and did it. And my life is freaking <laughs> like so much more rewarding and fulfilling because of it. So yeah, if anyone has a fear that they want to conquer um and lead into in like a not like a you know exposure therapy kind of way, but like very much in a systematic, um safe, calm way. Um, to ease yourself into those fears, like I would love like to to chat because that's something I've been like thinking about so much right now in my life and um really want to help others with that. So yeah, Hell tamfam.co. Yeah. Hell yeah. And tam is T A M P H A M dot co. Yes, that's yeah. correct. There you have it. I hope you got something out of this interview. I'm really trying to make this as valuable as possible to you. So if you have any feedback on how I can make this better, if you have any questions for me personally, 
I'll get back to you. Uh, reach out to me on Instagram. My handle is at Jeremy John Mary. You can also comment if you're watching on YouTube. You can just comment below. All right, thanks for listening and have an epic week.